Witch Museum. We are going to show you the witchcraft trials which took place in Salem Village in 1692. Do you believe in witches? Millions of your ancestors did. Worship of the powers of evil, of the forces behind storm and sickness and drought and death was man's first religion, and the witch was its priestess. Long after Christianity had come, it survived in secret. On the witch's Sabbath, the covens of thirteen would gather round their magic nine-foot circle. A fire would be lit beneath the cauldron, the scourge and pentacle and athame. A black-handled sacrificial knife would appear, and the ancient ritual invoking the evil one would begin. To the good folk of Salem in 1692, the devil and witchcraft were realities. They could hear him in the howling of wolves, in the creaking of an old house on a winter's night. They lived in dread of the Indians, of diseases such as smallpox, which killed their children without reason, of the home government in England even, which had threatened to take away their lands and their charter. Fear was the climate of their lives. And for hours every Sunday, their ministers warned them against the devil, the prince of darkness, who was everywhere, tempting them to sign his book to sell their souls for power and riches in this life. He it was who met with half-mad old women in the forest to perform unspeakable rites, who threatened us all with eternal damnation. Satan! He had come to New England so preachers like Cotton Mather said to undo God's kingdom, setting snares for the unwary. duties would not be encouraged to run and play, to meet boys, to be frivolous. The Puritan God forbade it. Trapped as they were in this somber adult world, it is not surprising that girls of the time became restless and resentful. But the hand of authority was so heavy upon them, they dared not express themselves, except sometimes in attacks of what we call hysteria. One house of the Reverend Samuel Paris. The center of these meetings was old Tituba, a black woman whom Paris had brought back as his servant from Barbados. To amuse the girls, Tituba told them stories or showed them tricks and scraps of magic, some of which had probably come over with her ancestors in the slave ships from Africa. Anne's mother may have thought to use Tituba as her means of communing with the dead. Chief Justice William Stoughton presiding. 
Even then, the townsfolk and the jury were not convinced. So the law put itself at the disposal of this gathering madness. Before it was done, 19 would hang. Another, Giles Corey, would die a still more horrible death, and hundreds all over New England would be sent to jail, some for up to seven years, languishing forgotten, long after the obsession with witchcraft had died away. Amid all this confusion, the farcical trials in which judge and jury gave in to the screaming of hysterical girls, amid fear and slander and random accusations, a few men stood out as heroes, steadfastly clinging to their reason and their principles, even in the shadow of the gallows. One of these was John Proctor. From the first, he refused to be swept up in the general panic. Unlike others, he saw the hounding of witches to be nonsense and said so. It was no use. In August 1692, this brave man and his wife were condemned and sent to jail. John's prophecy was coming true. The girls he had said will make devils of us all. Wait, wait, wait. Here is Sarah Daston of Charlestown. Her neighbors denounced her as a witch. She was tried and found not guilty. But she was too poor to pay her court costs and so held. Her relatives were years in collecting the money to free her. And before they did so, she died, innocent and all but forgotten, in this cell. And here is Tituba, the old slave, whose charms and tricks and tales told to pass a winter's afternoon were the start of it all. In fear of her insane masters, she has confessed and will eventually go free, never understanding what wrong she has done. Indeed, she did none, nor did any of the others. They were simply struck down by the dementia of their times, the way in ages to come men were to be struck down for holding the wrong political opinions, or for being of the wrong race. Burroughs, a former minister in Salem village, had been arrested and brought back from Maine. His execution was presided over by Cotton Mather, who had come from Boston for the occasion. It was thought in those days that a witch could not recite the Lord's Prayer without a mistake. On the gallows, Burroughs gave this final proof of his innocence. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom so died George Burroughs, Minister of the Lord, and 18 others in 1692, accused of witchcraft by enemies, superstitious neighbors, young girls in the grip of a vengeful hysteria. Once the witch mania had passed, it never came again to New England, and at its worst was never as bad as in Europe, where it is said millions were hanged or burned on suspicion of having made a compact with the devil. One might have asked then, and could still ask today, who is the devil? Anne tried to make atonement for the terrible evil she had done. As she stood in her pew, Parson Joseph Green read her statement to the congregation, among whom sat the children of Rebecca Nurse. 